The long reign of Nasr al-Din Shah Qajar can be seen as the end of an era for Persian history. It came at a transitional phase and its legacy is still very much embedded in Iranian history and thinking. Iranian history, Abbas Amanat, describes it as such. Even on a personal level, the reign of Nasir al-Din Shah still has tangible effects. When I was a young boy growing up in Tehran, I once asked my grandfather about his age. With a familiar pose that must have given him time to return to old memories, he could only give his approximate age. I was a boy of six or seven, playing ball in my hometown Kishan when the news of Nasir al-Din Shah's assassination arrived. Even at that young age, I found it fascinating that the death of a ruler should serve as the starting point in my grandfather's personal history. Some four decades later, I can see why that was a turning point for the people of his generation. The break with the ancient past of which Nasir al-Din was a symbol was as swift as the bullet fired from the assassin's pistol. My grandfather was a living link between me, that moment, only a lifespan away from the reign of Iran's last traditional monarch. The reign of Nasr al-Din lasted a little under 48 years, which makes him the third longest reigning monarch of Iran, a society known for its almost deific deference to monarchs, dating back through its ancient and mythologized history. In a world constantly shifting and changing, the Persian monarchy was almost an indisputable fact of life, and the world over. Death, taxes, and the Shah were the three constants of human existence. And even though he wasn't the last Shah, he was, for all intents and purposes, the last real one. The real ties to antiquity and a system of rule older than the sands. He was many things, and forced to wear many hats over his long life and reign. Reformer, dictator, appeaser, modernizer, executioner. He fought a war against Britain and was inexorably tied up in the great game between the Brits and the Russians, but he was also the first Persian Shah of modern times to visit Europe. He opened the first institute of higher education in the country and attempted to reform the old tax system, but he also had the leading force behind these reforms, Prime Minister Amir Kabir, exiled and then assassinated. He began his reign as a childish and ineffectual monarch, but by the end had developed into one of the most savvy and effective leaders of his time. His assassination set off a chain of events that would eventually leave us with the modern-day Iran we know. So who was this man? Nasr al-Din Shah was the fourth monarch of the Qajar dynasty. The Qajars, whose empire lasted from 1785 to 1925, succeeded the Safavids, 1501 to 1722, and paved the way for the Iran of modern times. The 18th century, with all its upheaval around the globe, mostly spared Persia of its destabilizing effects, and the Qajars were able to maintain a relatively stable central government, social structure, and economy. Iran is almost unique in that it is one of the only five nations that were never colonized, though unlike a Japan or Ethiopia, it was more similar to Thailand, in that while still autonomous, was bullied and harassed into concessions and treaties with ever-encroaching empires like the British and Russians. Persia was one of the most ancient and well-known societies on earth, but its once great might had long since diminished, and in this age of empires, it was vulnerable. Like the waning sick man of Europe, Persia was coming more and more in the sights of the British and the Russians, who, smelling blood in the water, started taking more and more advantage of Persia's weaknesses. The old ways were looking more and more antiquated by the year, and the luster was quickly fading. Nasr al-Din Shah was born on the 17th of July, 1831. He was not the originally intended heir, but his mother's political wrangling and machinations ensured he ascended to the throne when his father, Muhammad Shah, died in 1848. Nasr al-Din Shah began his reign as a reformer, but the rigid, established social structure, as well as his own dictatorial trappings, limited what was possible. Amir Kabir was responsible for most of these reforms, attempting overhauls of the tax codes and religiosity of the judicial systems, as well as emphasizing education and diplomacy with greater powers. 
While the results were a mixed bag, at least an attempt was made at Western-style reforms, and the rule of Nasir ad-Din Shah began troubled, but promising. Though that's not to say that it didn't have its faults. As progressive as Kabir might have seemed, he was responsible for the killings of thousands of Babis, a religious minority, of whom a few were suspected of attempting an assassination of the Shah. In 1852, the Shah had Kabir exiled and eventually murdered, though that's not to say reform died with him. Nasir ad-Din Shah was the first modern Persian monarch to set foot in Europe, visiting on three known occasions, 1873, 1878, and 1889. Under the Shah, the first national newspaper was introduced, as well as the first Western-style school. While in later years he regressed in terms of social and governmental reforms, the effects of his early rule began a path that would eventually fundamentally change the country we now know as Iran. On the international stage, it was a different bag. Persia became entangled in the great game between the British and the Russians over Afghanistan when, in 1856, the Shah seized Herat, a western province of Afghanistan. He had done so as a means of compensation for lands lost in the Caucasus to the Russians. Britain, wanting to keep Afghanistan as a buffer state between Russian and British interests in the region, responded by declaring war on Persia. The British eventually succeeded, and Herat was forcibly returned to the Kingdom of Afghanistan. Nasir ad-Din Shah had first ascended to the Sun Throne, he was seen as childish, unsure of himself as both a person and a leader. Over the years, he grew more confident, and his authority more and more secure, though at the expense of an ever-increasingly dictatorial style of rule. In 1896, he was assassinated by Mirza Reza Karmani, a follower of the pan-Islamist Jamal ad-Din al-Afghani. He was succeeded by his son, Muzaffar ad-Din Shah, whose disastrous rule had laid the groundwork for the Constitutional Revolution in 1905, thereby irrevocably changing Persia and Persian history forever. Nasir ad-Din Shah Qajar is a complicated figure. He was the last traditional monarch of a culture known for its very traditional monarchs. His long reign marked a transformation, whose reverberations are still felt to this day. While we may consider the Pahlavis to be the last dynasty of Iran, in truth, they were nothing more than a bastardization of their forerunners. They wielded the titles and power, but for all intents and purposes, Nasir ad-Din Shah Qajar was the last real Shah of Persia. Hey guys, I want to thank everyone who helped out with this video. Uh, links to everything can be found down in the description. First, I'd like to thank Flying Tonk, who provided some amazing art, as well as Ashworth, who also provided amazing art. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Kraut, who provided voice work. Like I said, you can find everything you need down there and give them all the love and support in the world.